Previously on DJ Peach Cobbler. We now return to DJ Peach Cobbler. Crassus needed a charismatic populare, you know, a real champion of the people, um, someone unstained by Sulla's bloody civil war which had just occurred, a, a politician named Dramatic Sting. Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had just barely avoided being placed in Sulla's burn book. I mean, the, the murder lists uh, that he made. Shoot her before him, but make sure he sees it. But after being bankrolled by Crassus into the Senate, he managed to work things out between Crassus and Pompey, convincing them to join into a partnership which could benefit them all. The three men created an informal political alliance, which we now call, in retrospect, the First Triumvirate. With Julius Caesar undoubtedly being the least important member, Crassus had soft power for days and countless politicians indebted to him, and Pompey had the love of the people. It was this partnership which ratified Pompey's actions in the East, albeit after a long delay, and this partnership was sealed by Pompey's marriage to Julius Caesar's daughter. It still strikes me as weird. Hey, I want to work with you professionally, but you gotta start banging my daughter first. Like, that's weird, right? The first triumvirate would benefit all three of these men greatly. Caesar ended up getting a consulship and governorship of a few provinces afterward. To be clear, you were supposed to get a province after being consul. Caesar got three. And also, bear in mind, being governor of a province also gave you legions to protect that province. Julius Caesar took this opportunity to do a holocaust, which was a wildly popular political move at the time. Caesar invaded the region known at the time as Gaul, but which is now modern-day France, Belgium, and Germany west of the Rhine. Now, Julius Caesar sent updates back home from his campaign. He kept a journal. Why Julius Caesar is great by Julius Caesar. Chapter 1. Girth. And you can see, when you read it, why Julius Caesar became so popular. Because that shit that he did was fucking crazy. Pompey once taunted Sulla and Crassus when he said that the people worship the rising sun and not the setting one. Pompey was, of course, correct. But as the memory of Pompey's eastern adventure faded and Crassus's reputation continued to sour, due to his acting like nothing more than a loan shark and political fixer, Julius Caesar became the first man to take legions into the dark forests of Germania and the almost mythical Isle of Britain. He'd fought towering, savage barbarians in the frozen north, the Triumvirate, a partnership in which Caesar was once unquestionably the junior member, became stressed as Caesar became the name on the lips of every man in Rome. Caesar, however, did not abandon the Triumvirate, as he needed Pompey and Crassus to stand for election as consuls yet again, in order to protect Caesar from his enemies in the Senate who wished to prosecute him for his war crimes. They're fucking French. Caesar's success, much like Pompey's had in the past, had bred a lot of enemies. Caesar pulled a lot of strings. He even sent many of his soldiers on leave to the city during the election as intimidation, but there was no need, really. Once again, no one stood for election besides Pompey and Crassus. The three-headed monster of Roman politics would not be challenged. Now, as I said, consuls would be granted governorship of provinces after the end of their year in service. This governorship would bring with it legions, as discussed, and also distance from the Senate, which, depending on what you're trying to do, could be very useful. Pompey got Spain, which he governed in absentia, and Crassus. Crassus got Syria. And it was in Syria that Crassus would launch the military campaign he hoped would make him the most powerful man in Rome. Julius Caesar had launched his campaign in Gaul due to migrating Celtic tribes passing through the lands of a Gallic ally of Rome. Whether or not Caesar's campaign was legal and justified was a topic of great debate in the Roman Senate. But his response to the migration was, was certainly not proportional. Listen, some Germans took our land, we're just migrating through, we're, we're very peaceful, okay? We've got women and children with us, we are not an army. Oh wow, this'll be really easy then. 
Crassus's campaign, in contrast to Caesar's, was absolutely unequivocally dumb and unjustified. It was an unprovoked attack on Parthia, mostly financed by Crassus himself, which was occurring exclusively to further Crassus's personal greatness. Crassus, prior to launching his campaign, met with Arta... Oof. You finally get a name that isn't Mithridates, and instead it's just unpronounceable. You, you can't win. You are about to watch a brief tutorial illustrating the early signs of Autism Spectrum Disorders, or ASD. Artavas... Artavastes? Artav... Artavas... Artavasides? You know, I could work at Walmart, I think, if I really... if I really put my mind to it. The king of Armenia and a ally of Rome offered 10,000 cavalry and 30,000 additional infantry for Crassus's campaign if Crassus invaded Parthia by way of Armenia. Artavastes explained that the Armenian highlands would slow Parthia's formidable cavalry, but Crassus declined, electing instead to invade through the flatter area in Mesopotamia, and he was already very confident in the seven legions and cavalry that he had. Crassus was very successful in the beginning, winning a minor victory against a Parthian governor named Silases, who retreated, leaving Crassus to loot and pillage some villages before crossing the Euphrates back into Roman territory and settling down for the winter with some hot cocoa and blood money. It was here that a Parthian envoy visited Crassus. Why have you provoked us, Roman? Already you've meddled in our affairs, sending the usurper Mithridates against the rightful king Orodes, and now you invade us unprompted. Why? Ah, uh, you know, that's actually a good question. Do you represent Rome, or are you just a maniac with a mercenary army and a lust for gold? Oh wow, that is another good question. You're just full of marcha. Uh, I'll have to think on it, but rest assured, when I reach Seleucia, I will have your answer. Hair would sooner grow on my palm than you would enter Seleucia, Roman. Go home while you still have a chance. So this is complicated, but it is so fucking worth it. The Romans took the hairy palm comment as a when pigs fly or hell freezes over kind of thing, you know, like hair doesn't grow there. So, you know, when the impossible happens, you will take Seleucia. You get it. But you know that old wives' tale? I don't think it's very popular anymore, but the old wives' tale goes that you will get hairy palms if you jerk off too much. The Romans had no awareness of this, uh, this old wives' tale, but the Parthians did. The Parthians had captured some Roman troops and found, to their bemusement, some pornography with them. The Parthians would bring slave girls with them on campaigns and found the idea of Roman soldiers just sort of jerking off all the time to be very funny. So really what happened was the Parthian made an insult that was lost in translation and that we only now understand. When I reach Seleucia, I will have an answer to your question. You will never take Seleucia. As you can see here, I've depicted you as the virgin Coomer Soyjak and myself as the slave harem owning Chad. Are those words? The Romans would traditionally sacrifice an animal and sort of look at its entrails to tell the future uh, before going on campaign. But when the entrails were handed to Crassus during this ritual, he dropped them in the dirt. Obviously a terrible omen. Crassus explained it away to the concerned onlookers as, you know, well, he was, he was, he was just old now, you know, it's just, his hand just slipped. Crassus was right. He was old. Long ago was his victory against Spartacus and his victories under Sulla. He was now an old man and must have been considering his legacy. Crassus had done terrible things, obviously, but that wasn't the problem. Romans did terrible things all the time. The problem wasn't that Crassus was a bad guy. The problem was that Pompey was a great conqueror. Caesar was a great conqueror. Cicero was an excellent orator. Cato was a tough traditionalist. All the influential politicians in Rome at this time were respected. Crassus once got a cross-dressing thug named Claudius Pulcher off at a trial because he bought the jury. Pompey and Caesar were loved. Cicero and Cato were respected. Crassus had nothing but a long list of men that owed him money. Conquering Persia, a feat not accomplished since Alexander the Great, was a feat no Roman could claim, and every Roman would forever respect. It was a feat so difficult, in fact, that no Roman would 
ever accomplish it. When Crassus entered Parthia that following summer, his legions began to melt in the desert sun. When they came across their first Parthian army, they were shocked to see there was no infantry in sight, only 10,000 horsemen kicking up the desert dust. The Romans locked shields and held the line against cavalry charge after cavalry charge, as they'd done in Africa, and Gaul, and Turkey, and Spain, and all the places in between. They would hold here as they did there until the Parthian horses tired and they ran out of arrows. But the Parthians would simply go to the back of their line and replenish their arrows from camels that were carrying massive bundles of them. They would batter the Roman line in shifts. Even when they'd look like they were retreating and the Romans could rest, the bowmen would fire arrows with shocking accuracy backwards on their horses. This is the famed. Parthian shot, giving not a moment of rest to the legionnaires baking in their armor. There was no Seleucid Empire left. There was no longer a world between Rome and Parthia. At Carhe, for the first time ever, unstoppable cavalry met immovable legions because they had run out of other worlds to conquer. There are a lot of details I'm skipping. I don't care for describing the intricacies of ancient battles, but reading about the Battle of Carhe was fucking Harrowing. It was there that the Romans met something they'd never seen before, and could not handle. What you need to know is, in 53 BC, Crassus led 40,000 men into Parthia, and 10,000 came back. Crassus' son, who was leading the cavalry, was killed in the maelstrom of conflict, and his head was impaled on the end of a Parthian lance and waved at Crassus mockingly. Not only did Crassus not conquer Persia and change his legacy to one of greatness, he led the Romans right into one of the greatest defeats they would ever see. And once he was caught, the Parthians would pour molten gold down his throat and cut off his head. In the end, Crassus made his way to Seleucia, a severed head filled with gold. Silases, the regional governor Crassus fought in the beginning, received the honor of presenting Crassus's head to King Orodes, as Silases had baited Crassus at the beginning of the war. Sorry, I, okay, I... I'm sorry. I thought the video was over. Do you think I have not just cause to weep? When I consider that Alexander at my age had conquered so many nations, and I have all this time done nothing that is memorable? Julius Caesar said that. Did you know he was going to invade Parthia? But, well, uh, you know, something happened before he could. It's so he was assassinated the day before he was going to leave the city and go on campaign. That's a pretty fun history, what if, you know. Julius Caesar idolized Alexander, like really all of Rome did, much in the same way I'm sure the Seleucids and the Ptolemies did, as they, they, certainly, they certainly tried to reestablish his old empire. You'd be shocked how many wars in classical antiquity were caused by men who just really wanted to be Alexander the Great. Long-time viewers know too much. You know too much. But you also know that I have a series about what the ancient Romans thought of the various cultures that they came across. I have several autistic fixations. For some reason, one of them is ancient racism. There's a reason this is not part of that series. I have found it exceptionally difficult to nail down what the Romans thought of the Parthians. I've tried. I promise I tried, man. It drove me to new depths of chalk addiction. It's getting bad. Please don't subscribe to my Patreon. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna blow the money on Crayola Bam Bam. You know, that sidewalk sidewinder. This is the best stuff that I've got on what the Romans thought of the Parthians. Crassus's father, 
uh, promoted the outlawing of perfume, according to Crassus by Peter Stothard. He, Crassus' dad, Promoted laws against expensive perfume, a product both extensively used by men in the East and expensively bought from them. Both aspects undesirable. So basically what you can get from that is um, they didn't like them. So it's very helpful. This is the passage. So perfume both came from and was widely associated with the East. And you know, there's something to be said about that, but it was not a thing like exclusive to the Parthians. Cleopatra famously had her ship's sails soaked in perfume. That bitch was fucking extra. The Greeks regarded the Persians as effeminate and perfumed, degenerate, hedonistic sissy boys with too much money, and it stands to reason the Romans inherited this stereotype because I don't think a Roman ever had a thought that a Greek man had not had a century earlier. Oh, this is fun for you Twitter people. There was a Turkish cult in Rome that castrated themselves and wore women's clothing. So Tom Holland, a contemporary historian, wrote in Rubicon, which is like my favorite, by the way. Where the fuck is it? I have too many fucking... My handwritings. Oh my god. Immediately beyond the Euphrates stood the kingdom of Parthia. Not much was known about it, except that the natives, like all Orientals, were effeminate and deceitful. Alright, so that's... something. But once again, all Orientals. The effeminacy was not a specifically Parthian stereotype. Furthermore, I'd really like an ancient source on stuff like this. You know, two tossed off statements by two admittedly, you know, well-respected, but still modern authors on history. Like that's, that's nice, but that's not enough to build a his, like a video, that's not enough to build a video around. I actually seem like I'm losing my mind. I need like a personal letter from Cicero or something where he's like, oh, the Parthians, oh, they had baby dicks and they sucked goat's blood. Like something, some spicy shit, you know, that smoking gun of racism. That's what I need. So I have one ancient source on a Parthian stereotype, and that is from Pliny's Natural History basically an ancient encyclopedia from the first century, an objectively great source. You have reached the page view limit for your Loeb class... All right. It was like a single sentence, something a, 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 Th a Scythian ambassador told Pliny. He said something along the lines of, the more the Parthians drink, the thirstier they become. And that's it. I've read hundreds of pages. I got these three things, and I've reached the page view limit at Loeb Library. They give you like two pages a month, I think. Because I literally, I went to the website, I found it, I left, I came back, and I reached the page view limit. This is a 2,000 year old book. I've got two tossed off lines from modern writers, lines that were basically just, you know, broader Roman stereotypes about the East. And an ancient source recounting the words of a Scythian man, which says, you know, like the same thing. Like, the Romans considered drunkenness to be a feminine trait, by the way. So it's basically fucking useless. I wish Julius Caesar wasn't assassinated. I mean, to be clear, he was a tyrant. He deserved to die. Fight me. But Julius Caesar wrote about the Gauls. I've got three fucking lines of useful material about how the Romans felt about the Parthians. I have this of the Gauls. Julius Caesar invaded and conquered Gaul. He killed a third, enslaved a third of the population there. Basically, eradicated a culture. And he wrote about the very culture that he was erasing. Julius Caesar wrote about the way they dressed, their alcohol consumption, their religion, their superstitions. To paraphrase Dan Carlin, Julius Caesar did not destroy the Celtic culture but he mortally wounded it. Julius Caesar nearly wiped a culture off the face of the earth, but I gotta tell you, he should have tried harder. Or Claudius should have gone farther. Listen, my girlfriend keeps taking me to Scottish events, and if I need to hear bagpipes one more time, I personally will push Hadrian's Wall to the fucking sea. Julius Caesar wrote down what the Gauls were like, and those writings served as a very simple and straightforward source for my video on them. And therein lies the problem. And it took me way too long to figure out the problem. All I've discussed in this series is the vanquished. I've drawn from Roman accounts on the cultures they've basically eradicated. 
The Romans thought many things of the Gauls, and the Greeks, and the Punics, and the Egyptians, and all those that they conquered and subjugated. But they never conquered Parthia. Parthia was always this formless other on the edge of the world, unknowable and alien. Parthia was not just an empire. It was one of the greatest empires in the world at the time, and it existed on Rome's doorstep for centuries. The Ptolemies, Carthage, Seleucids, Macedon, no other empire can claim to have stood against Rome like this. Crassus tried. Caesar tried. Mark Antony tried. Trajan tried. When Parthia did fall, it fell to an internal rebellion, so really there was just a new dynasty, and that new dynasty would later fall to Arab invaders, and those Arabs would fall to the Ottomans, and those Ottomans would wipe the last remnant of the Roman Empire off the face of the earth in 1453, one and a half millennia after Crassus died in the desert. So there's one thing that I needed to leave this video with. Parthia and Rome denied one another the greatness they believed they were entitled to. No Roman would ever be Alexander, and no Parthian would ever be Cyrus. Rome would never reach the Indus River. Parthia would never reach the Mediterranean. What did the Romans think of the Parthians? The same thing they thought about everyone else in the Eastern Mediterranean, but with one important distinction. Parthia stood in the way of the rest of the world, and the Romans could never accept that. Thank you for watching.